Imperialism and World Economy by Nikolai Bukharin, Chapter 5. World Sales Markets and Changed Sales Conditions. Every national capitalism has always manifested a tendency to expand, to widen the scope of its power, to overstep the boundaries of the nation, the state. This follows from the very structure of capitalist society. The conditions of direct exploitation and those of the realization of surplus value are not identical. They are separated logically as well as by time and space. The first are only limited by the productive power of society, the last by the proportional relations of the various lines of production and by the consuming power of society. This last named power is not determined either by the absolute productive power nor by the absolute consuming power, but by the consuming power based on the antagonistic conditions of distribution, which reduce the, com uh, reduce the con consumption of the great mass of the population to a variable minimum within more or less narrow limits. The consuming power is furthermore restricted by a tendency to accumulate the greed for an expansion of capital and a production of surplus value on an enlarged scale. This is the law of capitalist production. The market must therefore be continually extended. This internal contradic contradiction seeks to balance itself by an expansion of the outlying fields of production. This law of mass production, which is at the same time the law of mass overproduction, must not be understood to mean that the overstepping of national state boundaries is something like an absolute necessity. This necessity is created in the process of profit formation, and the amount of the profit serves as the regulating principle of the whole movement. The amount of the profit depends upon the mass of commodities and the amount of profit accruing to one commodity unit, which amount is equal to the selling price minus production cost. If we use the volume of commodities, the letter V, for the price of a commodity unit, the letter P, and for the cost of production per unit of commodity, the letter C, we find that the sum total of the profit is expressed by the formula, oh, for fuck's sakes, V bracket P minus C bracket. <laughs> the smaller the production cost, the larger will be the profits per unit of commodity. And assuming the sales market to be stationary or growing, the larger will be the volume of profit. The cost of production, however, is the lower the greater the volume of commodities brought into the market. Improved methods of production, expansion of productive forces, and consequently increase in the volume of goods produced are factors decreasing the cost of production. This explains the selling of commodities abroad at low prices. Even if such sales yield no profits at all, even if the commodities are sold at production cost, the volume of profit is still increased. Since thus, the cost of production is made lower. We do not speak here of sales made at a loss for strategic purposes, i.e. for a rapid conquest of the market and for the annihilation of the competitors. In the general formula V bracket P minus C bracket, the volume of production costs will not be that amount which corresponds to the volume of goods designated as V, but a much smaller amount corresponding to the formula V plus E, where E is understood to be the amount of exported commodities. It is in this way that the movement of profits compels commodities to overstep the boundaries of state. The very same regulating principle of capitalism rate or of capital, the very same regulating principle of capitalism rate of profit tax in still another way. Rate of profit acts in still another way. <laughs> we have in mind the formation of super profit under the conditions of commodity exchange between countries having different economic structures. Even in the epoch of commercial capital, this process of the formation of additional profit is perfectly clear. So long as merchant's capital, says Marx, promotes the exchange of products between undeveloped societies, commercial profit does not only assume the shape of out bargaining and cheating, but also arises largely from these methods. Leaving aside the fact that it exploits the difference in the prices of production of the various countries, 
Those modes of production bring it about that merchant's capital appropriates to itself the overwhelming portion of the surplus product, either in its capacity as a mediator between societies, which are as yet largely engaged in the production of use value, for whose economic organization the sale of that portion of its product, which is transferred to the circulation, or any sale of products at their value, is of minor importance, or because under those former modes of production the principal owners of the surplus product with whom the merchant has to deal are the slave owner, the feudal landlord, the state, and they represent the wealth and luxury. In these condi conditions, out bargaining and cheating were able to play such an important part because the process of exchange was irregular, because it was not the necessary process of metabolism in a society with a world-wide division of labor. On the contrary, it was a more or less accidental phenomenon. However, additional profit is obtained also at a time when the international exchange of commodities already becomes a regularly recurring moment in the reproduction of world capital. Marx gave a complete explanation of the economic nature of this super profit in the following statements. Capitals invested in foreign trade are in a position to yield a higher rate of profit because in the first place, they come in competition with commodities produced in other countries with lesser facilities of production, so that an advanced country is enabled to sell its goods above their value, even when it sells them cheaper than the competing countries. To the extent that the labor of the advanced countries is here exploited as labor of a higher specific weight, the rate of profit rises because labor which has not been paid as being of a higher quality is sold as such. The same condition may obtain in the relations with a certain country into which commodities are exported or from which commodities are imported. This country may offer more materialized labor in goods than it, than it receives, and yet it may receive and return commodities cheaper than it could produce them. In the same way, a manufacturer who exploits a new invention before it has become general undersells his competitors and yet sells his commodities above their individual values. That is to say, he exploits the specifically higher productive power of the labor employed by him as surplus value. By this means, he secures a surplus profit. On the other hand, capitals invested in colonies, etc., may yield a higher rate of profit for the simple reason that the rate of profit is higher there on account of the backward development, and for the added reason that slaves, coolies, etc., permit a better exploitation of labor. We see no reason why these higher rates of profit realized by capitals invested in certain lines and sent home by them should not enter as elements into the average rate of profit and tend to keep it to that extent. Marx, proceeding from the theory of labor value, gives here an explanation of super profits. From this point of view, additional profit has its source in the difference between the social value of the goods understanding under society world capitalism is a united whole, and their individual value, understanding under individual the national economy. Furthermore, Marx foresaw unexplained cases where a certain fixation of additional profit goes on, namely when a certain territory is dominated by monopoly organizations, cases that are particularly important in our times. It is thus obvious that not the impossibility of doing business at home, but the race for higher rates of profit is the motive power of world capitalism. Even present day capitalist plethora is no absolute limit. A lower rate of profit drives commodities and capital further and further from their home. This process is going on simultaneously in various sections of world economy. The capitalists of various national economies clash here as competitors. And the more vigorous the expansion of the productive forces of world capitalism, the more intensive the growth of foreign trade, the sharper is the competitive struggle. During the last decades, quantitative changes of such magnitude have taken place in this realm that the very quality of the phenomenon has assumed a new form. Those changes proceed, so to speak, from two ends. On the one hand, the process of mass production is becoming extremely accelerated, i.e. the volume of commodities seeking for a foreign market is increasing a phenomenon 
is increasing, a phenomenon highly characteristic of recent times. On the other hand, the free market, i.e. that section of it which has not been seized by the great power monopolies, becomes ever narrower. Moved by the requirements of home capital, the great powers very quickly subjugated the free territories. Beginning from 1870 to 1880, the process of territorial acquisitions went on at a feverish tempo. For our purposes, it is sufficient to give a brief account of the results of the colonial policy, which has become a veritable mania of all modern capitalist states. England, a country with a vast state territory, has, after 1870, succeeded in annexing a whole series of new territories. Bel Beluchistan, Burma, Cyprus, British North Borneo, Weihui, the territories adjoining Hong Kong and Asia. It increased the Strait's settlements. It took Kuwait under its protectorate in 1899. It acquired the Sine Pen Peninsula, etc. It annexed some islands in Australia, also the southeastern part of New Guinea, the major portion of the Solomon Islands and the Tonga Islands. In Africa, where competition and seizures were going on with particular intensity, England acquired Egypt, the Egyptian part of Sudan with Uganda, British East Africa, British Somali, Zanzibar, and Pemba. In South Africa, the two Boer republics, Rhodesia, British Central, Central Africa, in Western Africa, outside of increasing the former colonies, it occupied Nigeria. Such were the successes of England. France acted no less, no less successfully. Beginning with 1870, we read in a work of a French imperialist, we witness an actual colonial regeneration. The Third Republic placed Anam under its protectorate. It conquered Tonkin. It annexed Laos. It extended a French protectorate over Tunis and the Comoro Islands near, Madagas near Madagascar. It occupied Madagascar. It increased its possessions in Sahara, Sudan, Guinea, the Ivory Coast, Degomia, the Somali coast, out of all proportions. And it founded a new France, extending from the Atlantic Ocean and Congo to Lake Chad. By the end of the 19th century, the area of the French colonies was 19 times the area of France proper. German imperialism appeared later in the arena, but it made haste to re regain lost time. The beginning of Germany's colonial policy dates back to 1884. It conquered southwestern Africa, Cameroon, Togoland, East Africa, it acquired New Guinea, and a number of islands. Emperor Wilhelm's land, the Bis Bismarck Archipelago, Ar Ar <laughs> the Carolyn Islands, the Marianas, etc. In 1897, it seized Kao Chow. It made ready to grab sections of Turkey and Asia Minor. All this evolution being accomplished with feverish haste. As to the Russian colonial policy, we wish to remind the readers of the conquest of Central Asia of the Russian policy in Manchuria and Mongolia, and lately in Persia, the latter being accomplished with the aid of England, um, Colonel Likov as its hero. The same policies are pursued also by countries in other hemispheres, the mo most important of which are the United States and Japan. A consequence of this division of free lands and with them to a large extent of free markets, World competition among the national capitalist groups was bound to become exceedingly sharpened. Thus, between 1876 and 1914, the great powers acquired about 25 million square kilometers of colonial lands, an area twice the size of Europe. All the world is divided among the economies of the great nations. This explains why competition is becoming unbelievably sharp why the pressure of capitalist expansion on the remaining free lands increases in the same ratio as the ch chances for a grandiose free-for-all among the large capitalist powers. The tariffs only tend to increase such chances. The tariffs are barriers that stand in the way of the import of commodities. They can be overcome in one way only, through pressure, through the use of force. Tariff wars are sometimes practiced as a preliminary, 
i.e. rates are increased in order to extort concessions. Such tariff wars, for instance, were waged by Austria-Hungary against Romania in 1886 to 1890, Serbia in 1906 to 1911, Montenegro in 1908-1911, by Germany against Russia in 1893 to, 90, to 1894, Spain 1894 to 1899, and Canada 1903 to 1910, by France against Italy in 1888 to 1892, and Switzerland in 1893 to 1895, etc. The quicker the free markets are distributed, the quicker are they included within the tariff walls and the more ferocious competition becomes, the sharper are the tariff clashes between great powers. Tariff wars, however, are only partial sorties. They are only a sort of testing the ground. In the long run, the conflict is solved by the interrelation of real forces, i.e. by the force of arms. Thus, the race for sales markets inevitably creates conflicts between the national groups of capital. The enormous increase in the productive forces, coupled with the shrinking to a minimum of free markets in recent times, the tariff policy of the powers connected as it is with the rule of finance capital and the mounting difficulties for realizing commodity values. All this creates a situation where the last word belongs to military technique. The contradictions of capitalist development as analyzed by Marx become apparent. The growth of productive forces clashes with the antagonistic form of distribution and with the disproportionate or disproportion between the various parts of capitalist production, hence capital expansion. On the other hand, socialized labor clashes with the organization of capital as private business, which expresses itself in competition between national capitalisms. Equilibrium and a harmonious development of all parts of the social mechanism are lacking. In recent times more so than at any other, hence terrific crises and precipitous changes.